Welcome back to Student to Stud. Today we will talk about tibial shaft fractures and everything that you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline on what we'll be discussing today. Time for the first case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views of the left tibia and fibula demonstrating a displaced, comminuted, spiral distal third tibial shaft fracture with a comminuted distal fibula fracture. Now what should you be thinking about when you see this type of fracture? Immediately, you should ask yourself, does this fracture extend intraarticular or is there an associated posterior malleolus fracture? A CT scan was ordered which demonstrated a non-displaced posterior malleolus fracture. Later in this presentation, we will discuss the incidence of posterior malleolus fractures with distal third spiral tibial shaft fractures. This fracture was fixed with an intramedullary nail of the tibia with a side plate and a fibular rush rod. The injury films can give you insight on the energy that caused the fracture. Low energy injuries are due to twisting type injuries which result in a spiral fracture. If there is a fibular fracture, it will be at a different level than your tibial shaft fracture. A high energy injury will result in a tibial shaft fracture that is either short, oblique, or comminuted. If there is a fibular fracture, it will be at the same level as your tibial shaft fracture. To summarize this slide, a low energy injury will have the fibular fracture at a different level, or a high energy injury will have your fibular fracture at the same level. Tibial shaft fractures have a higher incidence of being open. The gastillo anderson classification is used to classify open fractures. You will be asked about this classification while you're on your rotations. This classification is predictive of the risk of wound infections with tibial shaft fractures. Type 1 has an infection rate of approximately 2%. Type 2 has an infection rate between 2 to 10%. Type 3 has an infection rate between 10 to 50%. And type 3C has an infection rate of 25 to 50%. I broke the Gastillo classification down into its simplest parts. Type 1 is when the wound is less than 1 centimeter. Type 2 is when the wound is between 1 to 10 centimeters. Type 3 is when the wound is greater than 10 centimeters or if the fracture is segmental or if it was due to a farm injury. Type 3 is broken down into three subtypes. 3A is when it's greater than 10 centimeters. 3B is when you require a free or rotational flap to close the skin. Type 3C is when there's arterial injury that requires repair. Classifying the injury can help tailor your choice of antibiotic. All open fractures require cefazolin, which is a first-generation cephalosporin. If the patient has an allergy to cefazolin, you can prescribe vancomycin or clindamycin. Once you cross into type 3 open fractures, you need to add gentamicin, which is an aminoglycoside, to cover gram-negative bacteria. If the injury was due to a farm injury, you will need to add penicillin to cover for clostridium. If you receive a call from the ED telling you that they have an open fracture, you need to make sure that they start antibiotics as soon as possible. Studies have shown that antibiotics within three hours is the most important factor to reduce the risk of infection. When treating someone who sustained an open fracture, you need to make sure that their tetanus is up to date. If their tetanus is not up to date, they need to receive the tetanus vaccine. The open wound should be irrigated with normal saline. Type 1 requires 3 liters of saline, type 2 requires 6 liters, type 3 requires 9 liters. Jumping ahead, when you surgically treat open tibial shaft fractures, you may need to use bone graft. If you do, you will need to use BMP2. You can remember 2 as 2 ends in O, which is the same as open. These fractures can have severe soft tissue injury, resulting in fracture blisters. If you see severe soft tissue injury, you should be aware of the possibility that the patient sustained a morel lavalet lesion, which is a closed gloving injury to the soft tissue, which causes a separation of the skin and subcutaneous tissue from the fascia. These fractures are associated with compartment syndrome. We previously discussed compartment syndrome in our lecture of tibial plateau fractures, but we will again review this condition. Compartment syndrome is defined as a pressure greater than 30 millimeters of mercury or within 30 millimeters of mercury of the preoperative diastolic blood pressure. Compartment syndrome can be remembered by the six P's, pain out of proportion, pain with passive stretch, 
paresthesias, paralysis, pulselessness, and poikothermia. You need to treat compartment syndrome with emergent fasciotomies. You need to have a high index of suspicion for the possibility of injury to the vasculature. If there is injury, you need to restore the blood flow within 6 to 8 hours. You will work with your vascular surgeon colleagues to restore the blood flow. The typical order will consist of the vascular surgeon placing a temporary shunt, then you will place the external fixator. When you are placing the external fixator, the vascular surgery team will be harvesting the graft, which will be used for definitive revascularization after you place the external fixator. After definitive revascularization, you or the vascular team will perform prophylactic fasciotomies as reperfusion can cause compartment syndrome. Let's turn our attention towards some pertinent anatomy that you should know. The tibial shaft is defined as the area that is 5 cm proximal to the plafond and distal to the tibial plateau. The leg consists of four compartments, anterior, lateral, superficial posterior, and deep posterior. It is worthwhile spending time knowing what is contained in each compartment. I recommend pausing the video and studying this chart. When performing a fasciotomy of the leg, you will make two incisions, the anterior lateral incision will release the anterior and lateral compartments, the medial incision will release the superficial and the deep posterior compartments. Like all injuries in orthopedics, you need to image the joint above and the joint below. You need to obtain x-rays of the knee, the tibia and fibula, and the ankle. A CT will be ordered if you're concerned for intraarticular extension. The article entitled High Association of Posterior Malleolus Fractures with Spiral Distal Tibia Fractures is a classic article you should be familiar with. This article demonstrated that spiral distal third tibia fractures had a 39% association with posterior malleolus fractures. It is important to know if there is an associated posterior malleolus fracture as you may need to fix prior to inserting your nail. The bottom right of the slide highlights a non-displaced posterior malleolus fracture seen on the axial cuts from the CT scan. You must know the surgical tolerances for tibial shaft fractures. I remember these tolerances by remembering the numbers 5 and 10. 5 degrees of varus or valgus, greater than 50% cortical apposition, less than 10 degrees anterior-posterior angulation, up to 10 degrees of rotation, and less than 10 millimeters of shortening. If all of these tolerances are achieved, you can treat the tibial shaft fracture non-operatively. There are many ways that you can treat tibial shaft fractures. If you treat these non-operatively, you will place the patient's leg in a long leg cast with the knee in 0 to 5 degrees of flexion. Operative fixation can consist of external fixator, intramedullary nailing, plates, or amputation depending on the severity of injury. External fixators will be used if the soft tissue is too severe or if the patient is unable to tolerate definitive fixation. When you place your pins, you want to make sure that your pins are greater than 14 millimeters from the subchondral line of the proximal tibia. This avoids the risk of causing septic arthritis as you are staying out of the joint as the distal extent of the knee capsule extends 14 millimeters. The majority of tibial shaft fractures are treated with intramedullary nailing, which we will discuss in the next few slides. Tibial shaft fractures can be treated with percutaneous locking plates. Sometimes amputation is needed as the leg is not salvageable. The LEAP study showed that soft tissue injury is the most important predictor of whether or not the patient got an amputation. They showed that the lack of plantar sensation was not an indicator to amputate. The overall algorithm when treating these fractures are to classify the injury based on its severity. Once you classify the injury, you can choose to treat non-operatively or operatively. If the fracture is open, you need to debride all the necrotic or contaminated tissue. Then you can treat with either external fixator, IM nailing, or plating, with or without the use of bone graft. Postoperatively, you want to have early range of motion to the ankle and knee to prevent stiffness. Intramedullary nailing will be the most common surgical technique you will see while on rotations. There are two approaches, infrapatellar below the patella and suprapatellar above the patella.
The suprapatellar approach will consist of the operative leg in a semi-extended position, where the infrapatellar approach, the operative leg, will be flexed. The starting point is crucial and is a common PIMP question. Your starting point needs to be anterior to the articular surface, best seen on the lateral radiograph, and it needs to be medial to the lateral tibial spine. The tibial nail will have a proximal bend. The apex of the bend is called the Herzog's notch. You may be asked whether or not you should use a tourniquet. Some surgeons use a tourniquet during their exposure, but you should not use the tourniquet when reaming due to the increased risk of thermal necrosis. Can you think of a few scenarios that will prevent you from nailing the tibia? Some contraindications are if the tibia diameter is less than 6 mm, if there is severe deformity to the tibia, if the tibial canal is contaminated, or if there is a previous total knee arthroplasty or arthrodesis. Another classic article you should read is from the Sprint Investigators. They demonstrated that ream nailing was superior to unream nailing in the treatment of closed tibial shaft fractures for having a lower rate of reoperation. This paper demonstrated equivalent outcomes with reamed versus unream nailing in open tibial shaft fractures. I highly recommend reading at least the abstract of this paper. There are several known complications when treating tibial shaft fractures. Patients will complain of knee pain after nailing. Stiffness is secondary to prolonged immobilization. Malunions can occur. Varus malunions is common if there is a tibial shaft fracture with an intact fibula. Think of the fibula acting as a buttress that pushes the tibia into varus. Valgus malunions are common with distal third extraarticular tibial shaft fractures that are treated with IM nails. Malrotation can occur. Compartment syndrome most commonly occurs in the anterior compartment of the leg. Neurovascular injuries can occur. If you use a percutaneous plate, you can potentially injure the superficial peroneal nerve. The proximal screws of your nail can injure the common peroneal nerve. The patient can develop a transient peroneal neuropraxia, which will resolve with time. The patient will have decreased extensor hallucis longus and numbness in the first web space. Nonunions can occur. The most important factor to the development of nonunions is if the fracture gap is greater than one centimeter. We classify delayed union if fracture healing has not occurred in six to nine months after the time of injury. Nonunion is when the fracture hasn't healed by nine months. There are several treatment options for nonunions. You can dynamize the nail, which works 50% of the time. You can remove the nail, re-ream and upsize the nail, or you can use compression plating. If you need to use bone graft, you will use BMP7. You can remember this as 7 ends in N in non-union starts with N. So when can you say that a fracture has united? A union is when there is no pain or tenderness at the fracture site and at least three of the cortices are bridged with bone. A simpler way of saying this is if the patient can weight bear without pain at the fracture site. We will finish with one more case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views, AP and lateral, of the left tibia and fibula in a skeletally mature individual demonstrating a distal third tibial shaft fracture with a distal oblique fibula fracture. A CT was performed which demonstrated a posterior malleolus fracture best seen on the sagittal and axial cuts. The tibial shaft was treated with an intramedullary nail and the fibula was treated with a lag screw and neutralization plate. Time to finish our discussion with some PIMP questions. Question 1. Are patients more at risk for compartment syndrome before or after surgery with an IM nail for a tibial shaft fracture? After. Question 2. What is the curve of the tibial nail called? Herzog curve. Question 3. How can you tell the difference between a tibia and femoral nail? Femoral nails have an anterior curve. Question 4. What is the starting point for the IM nail? Anterior to the articular surface of the tibial plateau and medial to the lateral tibial spine. Question 5. When reaming, how much should you overream to facilitate the nail insertion? 1.5 millimeters. Question 6.
BMP2 or BMP7 for open tibial shaft fractures. BMP2. Question 7. BMP2 or BMP7 for non-union tibial shaft fractures. BMP7. Question 8. After nailing a tibial shaft postoperatively, the person has a peroneal nerve palsy, extensor hollicis weakness, and decreased sensation in the first dorsal web space. What do you do? This is known as transient peroneal nerve palsy. You treat this non-operatively. Question 9. Less than how many hours to administer antibiotics is the most important factor to reduce infection risk in open tibial fractures? 3 hours. Question 10. List the tolerances for tibial shaft fractures. Varus valgus angulation less than 5 degrees anterior posterior angulation less than 10 degrees, rotational alignment less than 10 degrees, cortical apposition greater than 50%, and shortening less than 1 centimeter. Question 11. How many compartments are there in the leg? 4. Question 12. Define morale lavalle lesion. It's a closed to gloving soft tissue injury. It's when there's separation of the skin and subcutaneous tissue from the underlying fascia. Question 13. What type of tibial shaft fracture has the highest incidence of associated posterior malleolus fracture? It's the spiral distal third tibial fracture. What are the intracompartmental pressures that are indicative of compartment syndrome? Greater than 30 millimeters of mercury or within 30 millimeters of mercury of the diastolic blood pressure. Question 15. Before or after the application of an external fixator, should you order a CT scan? After. And that's all for tibial shaft fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.